In this chapter, we are going to be looking at the prehistoric Aegean. Now, what this is, is we are actually going to be looking at Greece, but this will be the time period before uh, what most of us are familiar with, with ancient Greece. So this is the time before ancient Greece. In fact, probably the most well-known work or one of them that comes from ancient Greece was Homer's The Iliad. Homer wrote The Iliad about 750 BCE, in the Iliad, if you're not sure, um, this was the telling of the Trojan War between the Greeks and the Trojans. This was looking at, back at a time period before uh, ancient Greece. And mostly it was often discarded as pure fiction, meaning no one really believed the people and the places existed. However, in the late 1800s, Heinrich Scheinman, uh, who was a wealthy German businessman, he was very interested in the area and he would start excavating. And he actually uncovered some of the cities Homer had described in the Iliad and then in the Odyssey. And this includes one site which had city upon city built on top of each other. And there was one that a fire had destroyed that, uh, the city. Frank Calvert, who was a British archaeologist, claims this is actually the site of Troy, because in, not in the, Tro in the Iliad, but in the Trojan War, uh, Troy is sacked. It's literally burnt to the ground. And so because of this, there's actually now this belief that this city of Troy actually did exist. And other scholars have agreed. Uh, Schleiman also excavated at Mycenae, where King Agamemnon, who was the leader of the Greek troops in the Iliad, uh, lived. And there they found a massive fortress palace, which we'll actually talk about in a little bit. These discoveries show a civilization, civilization in Greece that was much older than the known classical or what we call ancient Greece. So now we know before that there were these civilizations. Uh, other examples of this are Minoan Crete. Crete is the island you can see the bottom of the map. Um, Arthur Evans began work at Gnosis on um, an island of on Gnosis in, on the island of Crete. And this was actually considered to be the home the home of the legendary King Minos, who legend said he would often sacrifice young men and women to the Minotaur, which was half bull, half man, who lived inside of this maze. And Evans actually found a large palace that resembled a maze. And so he named the area and the people who constructed it Minoans after this mythological king. Other cities have also been found that give us more information based on buildings, paintings, and sculptures than we ever had before. And now part of this, so we also don't have a written language. We do not have a written language that we can decipher um, of the Minoans. And so because of this, artworks will be the primary tools for reconstructing life on Crete and in Greece as a whole during the millennium before the birth of Homer. Now today, we do have some information based on the prehistoric societies, based on some written documents, but these documents are in languages that have been known as Linear A and Linear B. Uh, linear A has not been interpreted yet. However, there have been some strides made in deciphering Linear B, and it's believed it is actually an early form of Greek. And so now, because of some of this, along with the objects that are found, we know that humans inhabited Greece as far back as the early Paleolithic period, and village life was established in Greece and on Crete in the Neolithic times. Prehistoric Aegean has three main geographical area, areas, and each has its own distinct artistic style. So first we have the Cycladic art, and this is the art of the Cyclades Islands. We have the Mino Minoan art, which also encompasses the art of Crete, and then Helladic art, which is the Greek mainland, and Hellas is Greek, uh, is Greek for mainland. And so what we have is these three main geographical areas. Now, each one is divided into early, middle, and late periods, but how this chapter is set up is he actually is going to look at the three different areas geographically. 
and he doesn't really break it down a lot into early, middle, and late. Think of last chapter with Egypt, how we had the different kingdoms. He doesn't break it down as much. Um, we're kind of just thinking it more of the geographic area. So moving on, we'll go to our first geographic area, and we are going to look at the uh, Silocladic, excuse me, art. And first we're going to talk about looking at sculpture. And now when we've looked at sculpture before, we've seen the artists are usually limited to what is what materials are around them. Well, marble was abundantly available in this in this uh, area. In early Cycladic period, uh, artists made large quantities of marble statuettes. Remember the smaller statues. And what's interesting with these, you can see there are two imaged here, is these forms seemed almost abstract. Now the works, again, they're unsigned and undated. And so we actually needed science to help establish the context, let us know, you know when they are from. Um, only then can we go beyond art appreciation to art history once we have some of that scientific information. And now there's also a note in the book, what happened is these statuettes became very popular. And so basically grave robbers, fortune hunters would go to these areas and they would take these statues or find something that looked like it and would often try to pass them off to make money. And so there's also this belief by some scholars that only about 10% of the known Cycladic marble statues are actually from secure archaeological contexts. Basically means that only about 10% we know exactly where they came from because there was an archaeological dig going on. And so what that does with the others is it actually leaves their authenticity to be questioned. Now, most of these statuettes do depict nude women, often with their arms folded across their abdomens. They do vary in height from a few inches to almost lifelike in size. Uh, the one pictured here on the right is about one and a half feet tall, but is only about a half inch thick. Uh, you can also see it in these very large, simple triangular forms. The head is almost triangular. The body, right, the shoulders go down to the pointed feet. That is another triangle. And so with these, we're again, we're not sure if they're supposed to be mortals or gods portrayed, but we do think they might have something to do with fertility because much like earlier examples that we looked at, they did take pains to show they were women. You see the very clear breasts and the exposed pubic area. Era. Um, traces of paint have been found on some of these, so it does indicate that at least parts of them were painted. Now, there were fewer statuettes of men, and usually they were doing something such as a musician, which is what we see here. The example here is a seated harp player. And again, we see these simple geometric shapes and large flat planes. And again, with no written documents, we cannot be sure of what the meaning of these statuettes are. All right, next we're going to move to our second area, and this is looking at Minoan art. Before the Middle Periods, most settlements were very small and simple, but beginning in the second millennium, is we saw the construction of these very large palaces. And so the Old Palace Period, as it's called, ended around 1700 BCE, and it ended very abruptly in the, with this massive fire. And so what most historians believed was there was actually a major earthquake that destroyed a lot of these um, civilizations or buildings that were in them, and then there was a new rebuilding period. And this is what's considered the Late Minoan or the New Palace Period. Now, these are, as you can see here on the left, these large buildings that were created. But again, we don't know if they were actually palaces, meaning we don't know if they were lived in. However, they contained administrative, commercial, religious centers uh, with courtyards for pageants, ceremonies, and games. And they had dozens of offices, shrines, and storerooms. So these large palaces were the center of Minoan life, and several have been found on the island of Crete, and they were all laid out in this very similar pattern. 
And what we're looking at here, this is the Palace of Gnosis. Again, uh, your textbook has the, the uh, uh, basically the blueprint, the design, you can look at it. And again, this is believed to be, they were called the Minoans because of the myth of King Minos with the Minotaur who lived in the labyrinth. So that's how these Minoans got their name. Now, the Gnosis is the largest palace found on Crete. And it has the maze-like connected rooms uh, around a central great rectangular courtyard. And you can see that in the center image here, that big courtyard. And everything else was designed around it. Um, what's interesting is the English word labyrinth actually derives from the design of the, no the Gnosis Palace. And it goes with the word labrus, which is actually a double axe. And that was a recurring motif in Munian art. And because of that, we get this association with that, with the design of the palace, which is the maze-like structure. So when we have the English word labyrinth, we think of these very intricate mazes. Now, this was built against the upper slopes and across a lower hill. And it would have been surrounded by mansions and villas of the elite from the Minoan society. Um, it was complex in elevation. At times, it was three stories high. And on the sides with the sloping sides, you could actually be as much as four to five stories. It was made of thick walls of rough field stones that were embedded in clay. And then you also have large stone blocks and large columns, which you can see in the image on the right. Now this had a very clear design and it was designed with light and air wells. And so what these were, you can see in the image on the right, that opening, what this does is this lets the sun in so you can see, and it also allows air in for ventilation. And what's also interesting is there was actually a drainage system underneath it. This was made of terracotta, which are baked clay. Uh, it was made of terracotta pipes underneath the palace to drain out the rain water. All right, moving on to painting. Uh, we did have many mural paintings along the walls. And unlike the dry fresco that we talked about in ancient Egypt, where the walls were dry and they were painted on, in um, uh, Minoan art, what we see is what's called the Buon fresco, uh, B-U-O-N, or also known as the wet fresco. And so what they, the Minoans did was they had those rough walls and they would actually coat them with a layer of fine white plaster. And then they painted in them while they're still wet. So what happens with this is then once that plaster dries, the work literally becomes part of the wall. Um, and they are actually believed to be the first civilization that used this buon or wet fresco technique. And so the image that we're looking at here, this is known as bull leaping. And this again was from the Palace of Gnosis. It dates circa 1500 BCE, and it's about two feet, eight inches in height. And what this shows, this actually shows it's a ceremony of what's called bull leaping. And this is where young men would grasp the horns of a bull and leap over it and try to land on the back. Now, most of this has been restored. In fact, the darker patches are what are original and the rest has been restored. And what's interesting in this is unlike some of the other works we've seen, we see the suggestion of action and of movement, right? With the bull, if you look at um, him, all four feet are actually our hooves are off the ground. Um, the figures in here, we see they all have very typically the Minoan pinched waists. Uh, the men are depicted darker, or there's the one man here, and the women are lighter shades. And this is something that was continual for Minoan art. Now, something they do have in common with other artworks we've looked at before, they are in profile, but they have that frontal eye. However, we can see they have long curling hair and this almost proud self-confident bearing is much is new in artistic composition. And then we also see these curving lines, which suggest the elasticity of living and moving beings. So again, making this seem much more animated, much more lifelike than other works we have seen. 
Now we also have in the island of Thera in the uh, Cyclades Islands, which is again part of the Minoan orbit, we actually have the best preserved murals. And these were actually well preserved due to a volcanic, volcanic eruption. Think Pompeii. Um, and what happens is these decorated, uh, these murals would decorate the walls of homes and shrines, not the palaces. And so what we're looking at here, this is called spring fresco. It is the largest and most complete example of pure landscape painting. And what we see here is the artist was not trying to show us what the landscape actually looked like but rather was trying to capture its essence, right? The artist is celebrating the rhymes and the rhythms of nature. Now, Minoan pottery also shows nature as a favored subject, and much of this pottery was actually created using the newly invented potter's wheel. They are decorated with a distinctive and fully multicolored style. And what we're looking at here is uh, what's known as the octopus flask from circa 1500 BCE. And it's about 11 inches high, but you can see the multicolor, right? The yellowish gold, the blacks on it, and how the octopus itself with its, its tentacles going out not only shows us the octopus, but the tentacles also emphasizes the shape of the flask itself. Now what's interesting about Minoan Crete is there were no temples or life-size statues of gods, kings, or monsters like we've seen in almost all the other civilizations we have looked at. So we have different examples. The first one is on the left. This is a sculpture known as the Snake Goddess, circa 1600 BCE. But again, we really don't know if this is supposed to be a goddess or if it's a priestess. Um, we don't know. This was found in the palace at Gnosis. And it's made of what's called fancis, in which is a glass-like uh, substance. Now, again, this may represent a mortal priestess. It may be a fertility goddess. We're not sure. Um, the idea of the exposed breasts, again, gives us this idea that it might be linked to fertility. Uh, she is holding in her hands two snakes. And then on top of the head is actually a feline creature. Now, what's interesting, this, this has been reassembled from shards. So we are actually 100% sure this is what it originally looked like. However, scholars tend to think that this might be showing the power of a goddess since she has a snake in each hand and the feline creature on her head is maybe showing the power of the goddess over the animal world. Now, the costume with the open bodice and the fluted skirt is distinctly Minoan in style. And then even more interesting in this is the harvester's vase, which you see on the right. This is circa 1500 BCE. And this is an example of Minoan relief sculpture. Uh, only parts of it are remain, we're missing the bottom part, and uh, it, the human, the forms used to be in gold leaf. Now what this shows is it shows young men either coming or going to the fields. And what we see in this, it's not as stiff and formal as other works. In fact, it seems very energetic. Most of the, the figures shown are in profile with the frontal eyes uh, facing, except for one figure. And he is just right of center. And he, uh, what's interesting with this is he's playing an instrument and he is depicted in full profile. Now look below him, right, or below his arm. And what we see are their lungs are so inflated as if to show off his ribs. And this is important because this is one of the first instance instances in history of art where a sculptor shows a keen interest in the underlying muscular and skeletal structures of the human being. And we are going to see this interest developed more and more in Greece and Rome and then through the Renaissance. And so again, this desire to understand and know the muscular and skeletal structure of the human body. Also, this degree of animation in the face has not been seen before. And we see these, even though it's a gathering, each person seems somewhat more individualistic. 
Now, with the Minoan uh, Empire, the decline, we're not really sure how or why it declined, but many do believe uh, that the Mycenaeans took over, and that's where we'll move next is to Mycenaean art. Now, much like we're not sure of the decline of the Minoans, historians are not really sure of the beginning of the Mycenaeans, but they know they were on the mainland uh, of Greece be at the beginning of the second millennium uh, BCE. Many scholars believe the Mycenaeans were mercenaries, meaning paid soldiers, who fought for the Egyptians and then returned home with their rich war booty. And because of this, they could have helped build these elaborate citadels, uh, warlike cities, and have this abundance of golds and other riches. So with the architecture we're looking at here, the structures are considered more citadels, meaning they are there for protection, for warlike reasons. Why the Mycenaeans were fearsome warriors and their civilization reflected this. Uh, Mycenae was one of several large citadel complexes, and the remains at Tyrans, which is on top, and Mycenae are the best preserved. Uh, the Tyran Citadel walls were actually about 20 feet thick, and again, you can see that in this upper image. And they did have some murals on the walls, but otherwise, any sculptural, sculptural decoration was rare. And then the bottom image here, this is what's called the Lion Gate from Mycena. Uh, this is circa 1300 to 1250 BCE. It gets its name because if you look in the triangular pediment, if you will, above the opening, you actually have two lions there. Now, this was the outer gateway at Mycenae, and it was protected to the left by a natural rock wall and to the right by a wall of large rocks. The opening, which was the only way to get into the city, the opening was only about 20 feet wide. So if an enemy wanted to get in and attacked, this is the only way you could get into the city and you would have the Mycenaeans would be have defenders on both sides of the, of the walls or of the entrance and above, giving them a clear tactical advantage. All right, next we're going to look at the treasury of Atreus. And what would happen is the elite families would actually bury their dead outside the city walls in these beehive-shaped tombs that were then covered in earthen mounds. Uh, a long passageway would lead to a doorway. And the tombs themselves, like we are looking from inside uh, the treasury of uh, Atreus, and what these were made of, of a series of cobbled courses laid on a circular base to form this lofty dome. Now, this would have different objects in it. However, the this was originally thought the treasury of Atreus was maybe it was where he was storing his goods. However, that's not true. And Atreus is actually the father of Menelaus and Agamemnon, who are main characters again in Homer's The Iliad. Um, this was looted, and so we really don't have any known artifacts from it. All right, then moving on, we're going to look at some of the metal working. Um, what we know and we would find, uh, the bodies as they were buried, the men's men would have masks that cover their faces, and the women would often be buried with their jewelry. And on the left, this is an example of a mask, uh, again, showing the rich, richness of the Mycenaeans. And this would be made from a single sheet of metal, and the design is pushed out from behind. Now, we're not sure if these were meant to be accurate portraits, meaning showing us how the person actually looked, but we do clearly see there are individualistic elements within the work. Now, the Mycenaean metalworker was one of the first in Greece to produce sculptured image of a human face at life size. Also showing their warlike nature and their riches, there were often daggers that were with the bodies. And these would be inlaid with gold, silver, and what's called nilo, which was a black metallic alloy. And again, shows the wealth and the warlike nature. The one we're looking at here on this side depicts a scene of five hunters uh, going to fight a lion. In fact, you can see the first hunter has fallen. It's under the lion and two other lions are running away. 
And what happens with this, it's interesting because it's giving us some sort of narrative. And this is not something that would have happened in Mycenae because there were no lions in Greece at this time. And then looking at sculptures, some were made of imported ivory, again, showing their wealth because this would be very expensive. And in the second millennium BCE, large scale figure art was very rare on the Greek mainland. But we're going to look at what is believed to be an exception, and that is the image on the left. And this is a fragment. It's a female head from Mycenae, and it's believed to be a fragment from a large sculpture. But again, this would have been an exception. Um, in fact, no large stone statue has ever been found in the prehistoric Aegean world. But what this one gives us, right, it gives us the illusion um, of what a, a large lifelike one might have looked like. And it also tells us that there might have been some in the Aegean, the prehistoric Aegean world. Uh, we see the painted face. Uh, most believe this is, again, the female form, the white painting, the red dots with the circular. Uh, this is believed to be traditional tattoos. Um, the eyes, the hair are actually a dark blue. And so, again, we really don't know the purpose of this. Again, if it's a, a, you know, a priestess, a goddess, or what. But it does let us know that there were some lifelike sculptures. However, they were not prevalent at all. And then the last thing we're going to look at is something that did continue in the Mycenaean culture, which is the vase painting. A uh, vase painting did continue, and this is what's known as the warrior vase uh, circa 1200 BCE. And what we see depicted here is a frieze of soldiers marching off to war. And you can see if you look on the far left, there's a woman bidding them goodbye. Again, this uses a combination of frontal and profile views. However, it's clearly not as detailed and definitely not as lively as the Minoan harvester's vase. And so when we conclude with this chapter, we want to keep in mind that, you know, ancient Greece was not the beginning of Greece civilization like was thought for um, a long time. That we do have the pre prehistoric Aegean era where we have these civilizations that were creating artworks and do predate what we know as ancient Greece, which we will discuss in the next chapter.